What's the best goofy movie of all time? For the millionth time, it's Moonfall. There is no movie... I, I will just say there is no movie more entertaining than Moonfall. There is no movie that will keep you talking for as long as Moonfall will. It's a, There's nothing even close. He's a tier one good man. Should I watch Moonfall tonight? Yeah. I'd say don't watch it alone. Watch it with a friend. You guys will be spitballing theories back and forth on what the f*** you just watched. When's the watch party? Hey man, they still haven't updated watch parties. Like I said, I'll do it the second they actually make watch parties like an actually good feature on Twitch. But it is highly neglected. Have you heard of a movie called ZYZZYX Road that grossed $5? Yep. That's infamous. Everyone knows that. No, I guess maybe not. Chat doesn't know that. Uh, there's a movie called ZYZZYX Road. I forgot who's in it, but it had one big name. Oh yeah, Catherine Hegel. It came out 06 and it made 30 bucks. $5 per theater that it was shown at. $1.2 million budget. I think it is, to this date, still the biggest flop in cinema history. I'm pretty sure. Wasn't the producer trying to make it flop? That just sounds like Cope. That just sounds like a, like a villain, like, ah, it was all part of my plan. In fact, I wanted to lose over a million dollars on this movie. You fools played right into my strategy. I think what actually happened is just nobody wanted to see it. It's a terrible name. Z-Y-Z-Z-Y-X Road? It's a stupid name. The trailer's trash. Oh, here, I see. It's shown once a day at noon at Highland Park Theater in one auditorium rented by the producers for $1,000. The limited release was deliberate. Grillo was uninterested in releasing the film domestically until it underwent foreign distribution. But the film needed to fulfill the U.S. release obligation required by Screen Actors Guild for low-budget films. Budgets less than 2.5 mil. The strategy had the side effect of making it, at the time, the lowest grossing film in history, earned 30 bucks at the box office from six patrons paying $5 each. And he even refunded two tickets because the makeup artist saw it with a friend. It's still not the biggest financial loss. It is the lowest opening box office. I don't think there's any box office performance lower than $30. Not for a budget over a million bucks. But yeah, if, you're, if we're talking relative flops, it's not the biggest by far. Worst $5 they ever spent. Disagreed. All six of these people are now part of history. Remember that Kevin Spacey movie that only made 600 bucks in its opening weekend, Billionaire Boys Club? True. Here, let's just look at the biggest flops. Waterworld's Notorious. Here, let's do the estimated loss. Wait, estimated loss for one of these movies was $88. The production budget was 46 bucks and it made $8. So how did they lose 88? They never even saw 88. Oh, millions. Oh my god, million. I'm sorry. <laughs> I thought this was just dealing with low budget films. I should have looked up 47 Ronins here. That's the uh, Keanu Reeves movie. Oh, Jesus Christ. I was like, oh, that so they're counting movies. Never heard of the Baron of Munchonson, Munchison, whatever that is. Ooh, Marsney's Moms. I remember this. I never saw it, but I remember the uh, uh, trailers. Mars Needs Moms. Eat that. You're not going to make me eat it now, are you? There's no good thing to say. This looks oh, great. I'm sorry. Mom? Mom? <laughs> I need to watch this. I still need to watch Norm of the North as well. I'm in a spaceship. This is so cool. Use the Polar Express technology. Okay. I'm just messing with you. <laughs> Welcome to Mars. My name is Gribble. This is Two Cats. What's your handle? Milo. How about I call you my bro? Check it. Wow. What is going on? Damn, this is it. That's pretty hype. I've heard of Tomorrowland. I saw this movie in theater opening day. I went to a church. There was a church near my old apartment. 
that would play movies, they'd have like one movie per auditorium. They had like four auditoriums, but you could see the movie for like three bucks. So I saw this opening day with Andrew, and this is still his most hated movie of all time, I believe. He was so offended at how trash this movie was, I'd never seen him so upset. I even think he went home and made a whole video about it on his channel. Ooh, Turning Red flopped. Twitter was in a frenzy about this movie. <gasps> $175 million budget and only a $20 million box office? Holy... Whoa, that can't be right. What? No. Oh, it was straight to Disney Plus. Oh. Okay. That makes a little bit more sense. This is probably what scared them off of doing more straight to streaming videos. Or movies. Like, theatrical release plus streaming. This right here probably scared them. Good lord. This <laughs> looks awful. Let me see. This is actually a great movie. Whoa! That's Matt Damon? No! Take me! Yeah! This looks cool! I'm just watching an AMV. Damn, why did this flop? That actually looks good. I'd probably like that now. In the year 3028, holy Jesus Christ. A masterpiece that destroyed Fox Animation Studios. Rough. This is a new video too. He also must have been going through the biggest flops of all time and caught uh, Titan AE caught his attention. Mulan, yeah, that deserved a flop. This movie was so bad. $200 million budget with $70 million box office. That's That sounds beautiful. That's great news. This movie was terrible. Man, Disney's got some of the most prolific flops on here. Pluto Nash! Let's go! I used to like this movie as a kid. Ah! A $100 million budget and a modest $7 million box office. Wow. Man, we, we don't have any Pluto Nash fans out here? Oh, this is so early 2000s. Pluto Nash, it is a pleasure to meet me. The battle between pretty... Let's get it right this time. <clears throat> and pretty Pluto Nash was better than John Carter. Look at me. Yeah, maybe. Well, uh, we were thinking a little more. You married twins, huh? No, they're not twins. I, I met the perfect woman and then I had a clone. <laughs> Which one's which? Damn, I don't remember this movie at all. The Adventures of Pluto Nash. Whoa! Whoa! Why don't you take these Hillary's? We appreciate you helping us out. I can't believe that movie flopped. That's a pretty big flop, too. 100 mil to 7 mil. Yuck. Final Fantasy. What? What is this? The Spirits Within. You're telling me they made a $137 million Final Fantasy movie and I'd never heard of it? What the? F no, I never even heard of this. Always the same. So is it just an original story? Must be. I don't recognize any of this. Yeah. Don't see how any living thing could survive out here. Yeah. I feel like Final Fantasy's strong point isn't going to be like a self-contained original movie for Columbia Pictures. So I imagine that probably just wasn't very good. Oh, yucky. That's a rough one for DC. Wonder Woman 1984. Yeah. That didn't pop off. That movie was awful. A Wrinkle in Time. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. This is that movie where they say the name Charles Wallace 10,000 times. I forgot all about this one. Oh, this was miserable. I know it's for kids, but Christ, it was bad. Jesus. I bet Artemis Fowl is going to be on here pretty soon. 
Terminator, Dark Fate. Not surprising. Matrix Resurrections. Yep. Yep. Not as big of a flop as I would have expected, but wow. What a remarkable disservice to the entire franchise. It was so dog anus. Like, I couldn't believe it. I, I don't know how you get up this bad. There wasn't a single thing in this movie that worked. It was like it was directed to be awful, like on purpose. And I saw that cope from a lot of people like, well, actually, the Wachowskis have outdone themselves yet again because they meant for this movie to be terrible. And thus, they succeeded and created a masterpiece. It's like, well, you made an awful movie on purpose. It's wasted my time then. Like, maliciously. Like, in the very first couple of scenes, they do this thing where it's, like, really meta. Where they're talking to, to bros. They're like, bros needs more bullet time. They need more action. They need more green binary. We need action bullet time because we just gotta pump it out. Don't care if it's good. Just pump it out. Lickety split. And it's supposed to be, like, really meta. And that's exactly what they did. They just made nothing but awful bullet time, horrible storytelling, no message, and everything falling to sh And some people acted like it was so genius for them to, like, include that scene where they're openly mocking how little effort they put into it. No, oh, this one hurts. Moonfall flopped. We may never get a sequel. Oh, casual hundred million dollar loss. Oh, God, why is there no justice in the world? This should have been on the top 50 highest grossing films of all time. Worst comes to worst, I'll make a petition. Those usually work. We need a sequel. They set themselves up for an entire Moonfall universe. Like, we have to realize that potential. We can't just let this masterpiece slip away. Is Moonfall your Morbius? I mean, that's... That doesn't even encapsulate my feelings. Moonfall is the perfect bad movie. Every possible thing that could be horrible about a movie is present in Moonfall, but done, like, it, it, like, it takes a savant to do what Roland Emmerich did here. He took everything that makes a movie good and done it, but with, like, the most beautiful I've ever seen. It's, like, two and a half hours, and it feels like 20 minutes. You go on, like, the most amazing ride through delusion. I, I just don't know how to explain it. It's such such a beautifully awful movie. Oh, I used to love this movie. You're telling me stealth flopped? Wait, this movie was so cool. I watched this like eight times. And there's that scene when Jessica Beale's like underneath a waterfall in a bikini. And I, I was still pretty young at the time. I was like, whoa. Them honkers though. Like the, this movie's about like a secret super special jet plane that gains sentience and I remember there's a scene where the main character Josh Lucas he's like looking at the I forgot what they call it what's his name in this movie he's looking at out the window and he's like what are you listening to over there and he's playing like really good music like rock music and he's like I'm listening to my favorite song and he's like how many songs did you download and he says all of them and then he blasts off listening to a song that's called bulletproof skin by a band called Institute, which isn't really a big band or song. It was so cool. I loved it when I was young. Oh, they even have a bulletproof skin AMV for stealth. <laughs> Let's go. I don't know this one. We're getting to some obscure ones. Treasure Planet, this is actually tragic. I still think this is probably one of the best animated kids movies Disney's ever done. Like, it's so good. This one is... A very sad story. It should have been one of their biggest grossing ever. Why did it do bad? You talking about Treasure Planet? There's actually a really great video on why Treasure Planet failed and why it shouldn't have. Failed because I didn't want 2D movies at that point. I don't remember all the factors that went into it. I really don't know. But this movie is an absolute masterpiece. Oh, this is the, the newest Fantastic Four. I never saw this, but I heard it was a beautiful stinker. Is this like a fun bad movie or just really not worth watching at all? The entire chat is just saying it's boring and just bad bad. 47 Ronin's sad because it's Keanu Reeves in this movie from what I understand was actually good. But I still haven't seen it. It's a cool concept. Like I think it's a really interesting idea for a movie. I just haven't seen it myself yet. Chaos. Oh! 
Tiana was watching this and she said she hated it. Yeah, this movie, the Tom Holland one, what a beautiful flop. $100 million budget, $27 million box office. I think it was only streaming. But yeah, this is that movie where men have like stink on them. And there's like no women on their planet. So then there's like a woman that gets introduced to the planet and she has no stink or something. Like what is it? I forgot. Like they can hear thoughts, like their thoughts surround them. Men have transparent thoughts. That's, yeah, it's their, yeah, it's their thoughts. Horrible way to explain it. Yeah, I mean, I didn't really get it. I didn't watch all of it, neither did she. Turned it off, it was just bad. It was just really bad. Monkey Bone's a good movie, it's Brendan Fraser, it shouldn't have flopped. Tragic. Wow, that's a colossal flop. $75 million budget with a $7 million box office. In 2002, or uh, 2001, that's prime movie going era. I know Monkey Bones credited a lot for Brendan Fraser's downfall in Hollywood, but I just don't agree. This was a good movie. Did I see this movie? Does anyone know? Did I make a moist meter on this? I don't know if I... I don't know if I saw this. I have to look this up. I don't... I genuinely don't know if I saw this, but I feel like it's something I absolutely would have seen. Oh, that is such a dangerous search. Holy... I didn't think... I did not think that through. I have so many porn deep fakes. Oh my god, that was close. I'll do Xander Cage. Wow. Yikes. We're fine, though. No. It looks like I never saw this movie. This is kind of cool. It's a 2002 action thriller directed by... Which... That name. Under the pseudonym of Chaos. Oh, I need to watch it. A voice crack. I need to watch a trailer. A former FBI agent named Jeremiah X. Sworn enemy. Antonio Banderas at his best. This woman single Can you believe this is what trailers used to look like? This was normal. I need you to find her. Of course you do. Wow. Look how far we've come. We're evolving. Tell him why you look so sad. I'm told it was because you just got beat up by a girl. Uh, this kind of just looks boring bad, but maybe I'll watch it at some point. The Mummy. Yeah, this movie was terrible. This is the Tom Cruise movie. I wanted it to be good. It stood no chance of being good. I knew this was dead on arrival from the second they accidentally released the trailer with no music or sound effects, and it's just Tom Cruise going, ah, in a plane. They did that. I forget that 2017's five years ago, so a lot of people just don't remember. Yeah. The first trailer that came out for this movie, they forgot to put all of the sound effects. So it's just Tom Cruise in a plane going, ah. Pretty hype. <laughs> when does he start screaming? Oh, there we go. No. This is what trailers could be, should be, even. <laughs> Man, Tom Cruise really puts it all on the line for this one. And this was the first little bit of the mummy we saw. So you could see why my expectations were so high going into it. I saw this in theaters with Andrew. This is another really enjoyable bad movie. I can't believe it made 150 million in the box office. I think they're lying. I I genuinely there is no part of me, there is no universe. Like, like there's not a single dimension where this movie made more than 50 bucks. Again, it was just me and Andrew in the theater watching this. And no one has ever talked about it since. It is a really fun, bad movie. I saw this in theaters when I was a kid. Hated it. Absolutely hated it. Glad to see it flop. This was terrible. This had Tim Allen doing his absolute best to try and stay awake on screen and failing. I've... Even when I was a kid, I was like, man, this guy... I liked Home Improvement. I loved Tim the Toolman Taylor, but I was like, damn... This guy does not want to be here. It's bad. It's really bad. Uh, let's do like any random zoom scene. Let me. That's not gonna work anymore. Um, we'll do zoom zoom movie scene. Just like riding a bike. The story is he hated being a hero or some. Sh
I don't remember why his brother didn't age, but Tim Allen's like 80. Actually, it's Zoom. <sighs> Zoom looks good. Nice suit, lizard boy. Welcome back, Zoom. Let's play ball. God damn. Yeah, the movie's awful. Glad to see it flopped. You've been hearing a ton of stories about how terrible the new Cats movie is, but I can tell you, it's worse than you're imagining. This movie is stinkier than two septic tanks colliding and erupting into a volcano. It is a bad movie. I'm not going to put it on the moist meter. Normally I moist meter movies, but this is one I really want to get into because I genuinely cannot believe that this was put on the big screen with the cast that it has. It is nuts. I took it at the movie theater before the movie, which is very rare for me. I don't usually have to unload before a movie, but I couldn't hold it this time. And the process of leaving my and hitting the water was a more thrilling adventure than the entirety of the movie. It is just so boring and bad by all possible measures. And it doesn't take long to figure out that it doesn't look very good. If you watch any of the promotional material, you can see how bad the cats actually look. And in the full movie, they're even worse because a, a lot of times the quality dips on some of the cats, so they look even worse. They look like Lara Croft's polygon tits from the PS1 in their face. It, it's weird. It reminds me of the old Xbox 360 feature that they tried out for a little while where you could scan your face with a little webcam and then you could put it on your NBA character or your Rainbow Six Vegas character and it always looked like some type of car accident victim on your face. That's how the cats look in this. Their little CGI here, it looks terrible. And the cats move around really weird, so they're always on like all four, kind of prowling around, but then sometimes they'll stand up and start snapping in like this, which I guess is supposed to look like, you know, how cats move. But I've never seen a cat that moves like that. They move around like zombies, like these zombies. It looks like Lego figurines that are being like snapped around and broken for a machinima. It, they move hauntingly. And I had to fight to stay awake in this movie because it was so genuinely boring where every song ended up sounding exactly the same and there's only singing. There's no like actual story or dialogue. There is a story, but there's no like actual dialogue to get it across. It's only expressed through song and dance and all of the songs and dances are so similar that I was just falling asleep. But I didn't want to fall asleep because I didn't want to miss a second of this train wreck and I knew if I fell asleep there I'd be having some absolutely horrible nightmares and I'd wake up semi-chubbed and covered in piss or something because it's horrifying. Everything looks terrible in this movie. It looks awful. A truly awful looking movie. And there's some really weird looking cats too. Like there's one called like Scrimble Skank, uh, or Scrimble, Scrimble Cat, who's like a railway cat. And he looks like Super Mario if Mario was a tap dancing stripper. The choices on these characters' looks is so disturbing throughout the entirety of this film. I just can't believe that people would sign up for this. I'd rather have my tape leak than be caught acting in this movie. It'd be less- Being put on this offender's registry would be easier to explain to friends and family than explaining your role in this film to them. It's just so- And apparently the actors and actresses went to cat school for this? I can't even imagine what that kind of training dojo would look like. It must smell like- Full of just like degenerate actions going on there but apparently they went to cat school to learn how to act like cats and it doesn't show that training did not pay off they autopiloted those courses or, or those teachers those senseis just they don't know what they're teaching because nothing looks like cats in here i could have acted in this as one of the cats and it would have been right at home with what everyone else was doing it was the most simple actions like how a four-year-old would act like a cat it's not like they really showed that they had this kind of immense training and cat actions and the physiology of cats, uh, you know, method acting. It's just really garbage. And this movie has a story. It's not good, but it does have one, and there's only two plot points in it. Uh, I'm going to get into some spoilers now just to talk a little bit more in depth about what makes it bad aside from just the obvious stuff. The story is as follows. Spoiler. The cats are competing to ascend and be reborn. It's a competition among all these cats to be reborn, and the entire movie is bringing in new cats that have their own theme song and dance, so it's basically just WWE intros for all these new cats that come in that want to be reborn. And the main villain is Nightcrawler. He has the powers of Nightcrawler from the X-Men who can just, you know, snap his fingers and he says, like, meow, and he vanishes into dust, like, a, you know, and then transports people onto a ship to get them out of the contest. Those are the only two plot points, that villain and that note. And at the end of the movie... There's a cat who's been alone this entire time, and all that cat wants to do is have friends and be accepted into society. 
And at the end of the movie, the main character brings that cat in, and everyone falls in love with that cat. She's got all these friends. And then the main cat, Udo Thurnanobidian, I already forgot the goddamn name because the names are goddamn awful. It's impossible to remember them. But the main cat that's choosing who ascends decides that that cat should ascend. So how does she ascend and get reborn? Well, naturally, they send him away on a goddamn air balloon suicide mission. So this cat that just wanted friends this entire time finally gets all of her friends. She's in this club now. She's part of the family. Is chosen to ascend on a suicide run. Like, I, it's not... That's not a satisfying conclusion, you know, you have this whole movie built up over how great the being reborn and it's going to be, you know, everyone's fighting for it. And then finally, the one cat that gets everything she wants and is finally part of this family gets it taken away, gets thrown into this flying chandelier hot air balloon contraption going straight to heaven. I mean, that's not, that's not a good conclusion. Like, if you think about that, that's sad. She went the entire movie totally alone and is finally brought in only to have it immediately taken away and it's supposed to be like a... I mean, you don't see her get reborn. She doesn't come back. She just gets sent off to God knows where. Maybe she doesn't even... Maybe she just gets stranded and alone again in an unfamiliar area. It's a, it's a sad conclusion. But it's not supposed to be. This is supposed to be like the highest possible, but it ends up being like suicide. It reminds me of like cult. I feel like these cats were just like this giant cult where they indoctrinated everyone and now they're making her drink the Kool-Aid. It's... it's terrible and it's silly it's weird they're singing all these happy songs but the whole time i'm thinking this girl just got everything she wanted and now you're you're sending her into the sun it's it's a weird conclusion the whole movie's just not good and it has these awful 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 attempts at humor the worst i've ever seen in the big screen and i don't say that lightly genuinely the worst attempts at comedy possible but you knew that was coming since james corden's names on this but they actually unironically unashamedly say things like look what the cat dragged in or don't mess with the cat lady it's bad Super goddamn bad. And the last goddamn musical number in here lasts five minutes, and it's a tutorial on how to talk to your cat. It's horrible. And I really cannot explain why they decided to take it from the stage play to a movie, because at no point in this movie do they use anything that a play doesn't. The only thing this movie has that the play doesn't is horrible CGI. That is the only thing this movie has that makes it a movie outside of the play. Everything else could have just been a play that they recorded here. It is terrible. There was no reason to take it from a play to a movie if they're not even going to use anything movies can offer. There's really no incredible effects. There's nothing. It seems like most of it's like practical effects anyway, or at least it could be. The only two effects that they couldn't get in a play that they get here is the dust particles when uh, the bad guy vanishes, McCavity when he vanishes, and the horrible, horrible CGI that this movie would be better without. I don't understand what the point was in translating this to a movie. It made it even creepier and significantly worse. I've never seen the play. I have no intention to, but I know that the play is definitely going to be better than this because one of the biggest problems with this is how garbage it looks, which the play wouldn't suffer from because it's actual people and costumes and effects here. It's horrible, 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 horrible animation that falls apart constantly. Sometimes if you look at the background characters during their dances, their limbs get all like noodly, like in the DC movies when like the Flash runs and his limbs start popping out of place and he looks like a goddamn wet noodle flying around. Yeah, some of the cats have that problem in the background here too. It's just not good. No matter how you spin this movie, even if you're a fan of musicals like the biggest possible fan, the musicals don't translate well because it, it, there's really like almost, well I can't say no effort given to them because there is, but it's just not well done because the musicals all blend together and become so samey that you start to wonder which musical you just heard and for what cat and what it was about and was it was it even good and the answer is no because it, it really isn't it's just a really movie and it's so horny this movie is so incredibly horny i felt like i was watching an illegal fetish it, it's just a w really over the top kind of movie it, it's, it's silly silly and sad and scary Made me feel a lot of things movies don't make me feel. But uh, I can tell you it didn't make me feel good. That's the one thing I can say for certain. I, I don't see who would enjoy this movie. I'm sure some people will somewhere out there. You know, I, I don't even see furries liking this. Because this is not even furry bait. This doesn't even fall into any category or niche of furryism. This, like, this transcends everything we thought we knew about furries and musicals. It's nuts. It's really bad. And uh, I, I wouldn't recommend it even as a so bad it's good experience because it was so bad that it made me want to fall asleep. But I didn't want to because I don't like missing bad movies. It's just a boring, 
bad, not good, not fun time that I can't understand what the point of making it was. That's it. See ya. We've all wasted money on something at some point in our lives. I know I'm guilty of that. I once spent $200 on a pocket trumpet that I never learned how to play. And then an additional, like, $150 on a theremin that I only tried to play a couple of times and never mastered. And these two items now just haunt my shelves in the closet. Big waste of money, and I do regret it. Of course, this is going to vary from person to person, but I can say with a high level of confidence you have not wasted as much money as Universal did for the rights to The Exorcist. 400 million clams in order to buy the rights for The Exorcist to make a trilogy out of it, and the first movie just dropped called Exorcist Believer. And I'm here to tell you after seeing it that this was the worst money ever spent. They blew their load with 400 mil and had nothing left over for writers, so they really relied on ChatGPT to scrap something together. This is laughable. This movie did not make me a believer in the future of this franchise. It made me a believer in true in Hollywood to allow this type of terrible blemish to exist. This film is insulting to the legacy of The Exorcist. It is by far the most influential horror movie ever made, The Exorcist I'm speaking about, and to have this movie now coming out, even though I know the second and third Exorcist movies aren't exactly the best, this is so much worse. They could have spent $400 million for the rights to Jimmy Neutron and made a Hugh Neutron spinoff and it probably would have been higher quality than this. And they had self-reflection on like the importance here of what they were making. Blum, Jason Blum of Blumhouse, who was a producer on this film, even said that it's the riskiest movie he's ever made. Just because it's so expensive, usually the bar to success on everything we do because it's inexpensive is incredibly low. For The Exorcist, it's high. And that's an understatement. It's extremely high. And man, did it fall flat on its face. Now let's dive in. I'd like to explain why I think this movie is so bad and perhaps the biggest waste of money I've ever seen from a Hollywood gamble. So... I'll go ahead and tell you, there's two compliments I can give this movie. I'll start off with the good here before getting you with the knuckle sandwich with the bad. The good. It has an interesting premise. It has a couple of interesting ideas. And best of all, it's not that long, so it ends pretty quickly. That's, of course, relatively speaking, it's about two hours long, but by modern movie standards, that's pretty quick these days. Everything wants to be like two and a half, three hours all of a sudden, so at least this is refreshing that it's only two. Those are the only compliments I give it, and one of them is just that it ends, so you can leave and, and forget that you ever watched it. The biggest sin this movie commits, though, is being a snooze fest. It is just unforgivably boring. If I didn't drink some gamer subs before going to the theater, I probably would have fallen asleep there trying to stay awake through this one. Uh, so I'm going to shout out Gamer Sups because Big W from Gamer Sups here, I had some milk, which is one of their flavors, before going. I know if I just say milk cold turkey like that, you won't know what I'm talking about. It's not real breast milk, that's just one of the flavors Gamer Sups offers, and it's my personal favorite one. I highly recommend Gamer Sups. I love it. If you want to get some free samples, you can click the link in the description below. It's completely free, not even a shipping cost. Gamer Sups will just send out a bunch of samples for you to try, and you will most likely enjoy them. And... Yeah, if you also just want to use my code, it's code moist at gamersups.gg in order to get a discount on any of the items you might want to purchase. So, big thanks to Gamersups. I am going to be getting into spoilers here, so this is your... I, I can't talk about what makes this movie so bad without some spoilers. Sorry in advance, but this is your... The film's plot. It follows a widower who has a daughter who really wants to meet her mother. And one day, after school... Her and a friend go into the woods to perform a ritual to try and communicate with her mom. Obviously, things go south. Uh, it leads to a possession. And instead of one possession, one person being the victim of a demonic possession, it's both girls. They both become possessed. And I do think that's an interesting idea. Albeit, I don't think it's the most creative idea like some people are making it out to be. It, you know, all it did was say, what if instead of one, there's two? What if we just, two of them? You know, it's not exactly a galaxy brain scheme. It's just they added another character to be possessed. And then the other character that's not the widower's daughter is kind of an afterthought. In fact, her entire family is an afterthought. You probably won't even remember their names by the time the film's over because they give them no time to develop and they have nothing to do here except endlessly whine. They're just these personalityless drones, like these forgettable side characters that pop up occasionally in Skyrim to say a few lines before going along their way all robotic, never to be seen again. That's that entire family. 
So it feels like, why even bother with two possessions if you're only going to focus on one of the families? It just doesn't make a ton of sense. I do think the dynamic of a double whammy possession could have worked well, and it does to a certain extent sometimes work decently here, if they had just given it more care. Like, there's definitely potential here that wasn't realized at all, really. But, like, there were a couple of decent moments with the two possessions, especially at the end. I could see some glimmer of possibility with this idea. Aside from the lip syncing sometimes, it makes it very clear that it's dubbed. So if you've seen The Exorcist, if you've seen any Possession movie, you know how it goes. They'll have a demon voice coming out of the child's body, and in here, sometimes the lips don't match up with the words. So it really feels like a poorly dubbed Team Four Star moment sometimes. Like, how could you even let some of that slide? It's very obvious. Also, speaking of things without a purpose in this film, they brought back Ellen Burstyn from the original Exorcist, so it shows you that this is a direct sequel. And unfortunately, Ellen Burstyn has nothing to do here. They did her dirty. It's downright disrespectful because she has no role to play in this film. If you took her out, the entire film plays out exactly the same. Not a single iota of difference, whether she's here or not. It's purely as a, like, point-at-the-screen cameo moment. Like, oh, I know her! That's it. Nothing else. It's, it's pathetic, really. Like, it just, it feels like it's misleading advertisement because she's in the trailer quite a bit, but she's not in the movie at all. I, so I already gave you the spoiler. All she does is serve as a brief, brief side quest where Victor is trying everything to get his daughter back and out of the hands of the demon. He eventually finds her through, you know, searching around. Victor then goes up to her, fills her in on the situation. We learn that she and her daughter, Reagan, aren't on good terms and she hasn't seen her daughter for a really long time. She agrees to help Victor and goes to one of the girl's houses, Catherine, and attempts to save her from the demonic presence. But in doing so, Catherine stabs both of her eyes. So now she's blind. And then that's it. We don't see her again until the very end. She exists solely in this film to get her eyes popped like bloody water balloons. And that's it. It just feels like such a waste to even have her here. This feels like a role they wrote before she had committed, so they wanted to make sure that if she said no to the role, it wouldn't change the outcome of the film, so they just gave her a throwaway role to play here. Which is just su it's super dumb, it really is. But I wanted to point that out, because that really stood out to me. There's just so many characters in here that actually don't serve a purpose. Like, I don't know why they're even bothering to put them in the film in the first place. But anyway, the, her getting, her, her eyes getting stabbed is one of the very few times that something even happens in this movie. I mentioned that it's boring, but I mean it is turbo boring at times. It had me wishing I was back in college listening to a professor lecture me about the Krebs cycle. That would have been more entertaining than some of these uh, sections of the film. Now, the beginning of the film is spent trying to develop the characters a little bit. It's kind of like two different movies slammed together. The first half is trying to find where the girls went and what could have happened. The second half is then all of your generic horror movie tropes <laughs> crashed together haphazardly. And the first half I've seen get a lot of praise. You won't see it get any praise from me, though. I think everything it wanted to do in the first half was not done very well. Like, I think the intro is good, but then it doesn't really get you hooked on these character relationships. Victor and Angela only share brief exchange before Angela and Catherine go into the woods and go missing. And Catherine's family is basically just ghosts here. You know, like, you, you barely even see them. And when you do, they do nothing but just go, ooh, and then you just, you know, forget about them. But, like, there's not a whole lot of time spent developing these characters before they go missing. Now, of course, there's some development while they're looking for them and searching, and when they do eventually find them, trying to piece together what exactly happened. But I just don't really see where people are coming from when they're talking about how great this first half was. Because I just don't think it was done very well at all. It could have been done much better. But anyway, let's start talking about the worst parts of the film, and that's its attempt at horror. I say attempt because I think it just fails completely at delivering anything that even resembles horror. It tries to rely on jump scares, but doesn't know how to do them. It's like they don't know what a jump scare is. So what'll be happening is, characters will be having just a normal conversation or normal things happening, and then all of a sudden it'll just flash a couple of images at you, like you're playing the scary maze game from back in 2009 or whatever. Like, they'll just be talking, 
and then all of a sudden, scary image. Ooh, look at this creepy figure, and here's kind of a loud noise. But it, you know, they were mid-conversation. It's not like a jump scare. They were actively talking, and now all of a sudden there's just like a weird thing on screen and a louder noise. That doesn't like startle anybody. Like, they weren't, well, jump scares, and executing a jump scare is the easiest thing in the world. Just go silent, and then, bang, huge noise, crash, ten trash cans together with this huge noise and the creepy face or something. But they don't even do that, they just randomly, I guess maybe bad editing is to blame, but randomly just start putting a couple of flash creepy images with, like, a slightly louder sound. So, the jump scares don't even work, and that's the only thing it ever really does for horror. The... Suspense doesn't exist in this movie. There's no such thing. I Like I said, I do think the child actresses do a decent job of like looking creepy and like moving around creepy occasionally. But even that isn't utilized very much because they're very quickly bound to chairs and then spend like 30, 35 minutes being bound to chairs as people recite prayers around them. I'll get to that in a moment though. But yeah, I really don't know what people would find scary about this and that's not just coming from like a, oh i'm a tough man look at my machismo i don't get scared at horror movies i just really don't think they even attempted anything here unless you were just really you know disturbed by the sound of a heavily filtered creepy sounding voice i suppose but like i'll give you another example of something they tried to do that i think was supposed to be scary victor's brushing his teeth and the lights keep flickering literally like uh, the scene out of Spongebob with the hash-slinging slasher, and they turn around and it's Nosferatu. That exact scene happens in here. Victor's brushing his teeth, the lights are flickering, he's looking up, lights keep flickering, he turns around, and it's just Angela flicking the light switch on and off, and he's like, hey, cut that out, you know, let's, let's go back over here. And then he goes back to it, and the lights start flickering again, and then she just goes, what did you say? And, like, that's the whole scary scene. It's like, what the was that? Like, that was lame, super lame. And, and then there's another scene where she, like, attacks Victor, but it's it's not even, like, startling or a jump scare she like comes up behind him and like attacks him super quickly and then that's it and he's fine and then she, she just closes the door like it's all just i don't know it feels like they didn't know what they were doing so they just went in on filming days and improvised I, like it just i have no explanation for it because it's like they didn't even try also this isn't exclusive to this movie but i am so tired of the trope that when you're dealing with a possession all you need to do is speak sternly to it to get it out so when Ellen does actually go and confront Catherine for a moment, her strategy is, Hey, get out of there. Hey, quit goofing around. That, that body belongs to that child, Catherine. Not you. Get out of there. Get that scram. Get out of town. And the demon's like, ah, no, no, ah. Like struggling around and like falling and flopping like a fish out of water. It's like, what? why does that work? Like, why is this doing anything at all? Unless it was just... Unless it was also pranking her, but even still, that's so silly. It's so stupid. Like, she's not doing anything besides just speaking to it like a disappointed parent. Like, oh, come on now. Qu quit with this nonsense. Qu hey, come on. Like, it's just... The way that demons are fought in possession films, I think is just the goofiest ever. They've gotta find other things to do to fight demonic possessions. Like, just saying its name, and it, like, vanishing and, like, screaming, Ah! It said my name! The human said my name! Ah! And then, like, burns back to hell. Is stupid. And then just them saying, Hey! The Lord doesn't like what you're doing there, so get out of there! And it's like, No! Ah! It's, it's, and I just needed to point that out. So, let's just, I don't even know why I'm getting so into the weeds here. The movie just... But let's just talk about the end here. Eventually, they tie both of the girls to some chairs and they're trying to perform a ritual with like a ton of different prayers, a ton of different belief systems that they're all throwing their way to try and get the demons to leave. Um, eventually, it's not working. So what ends up happening is uh, a very powerful uh, pastor comes in and he touches both their heads and he's like, Christ says, get out of there. And the demons are like, no, nah. it's like everyone's getting really optimistic because it's finally working. They're going to get their daughters back. But then the daughters snap his neck with like telekinesis. So he's, it's the only thing in the film. And it, it was a pretty gruesome. I didn't expect that. So that one actually caught me off guard. That was a pretty decent moment, actually. And then they never do that again. They just go back to just sitting there laughing. Like, well, not even laughing. Like there's a scene where they're getting some like water tossed on them and they're like screaming in agony and like, the, there's a burning sound, but they're totally still fine. And they're just... It's, my big problem here is 
The demon at no point was in any danger of actually getting exercised at all. But, for some reason, they kept pretending like they were getting somewhere. And then eventually, the demon says, You must make a choice. One of these girls will live, and one of them you choose. Why? You could just, you could just have both of them. Because they have done nothing to actively stop you. Like, they have not been able to effectively fight you. So why all of a sudden would you give up one of the girls? It just, it didn't, it didn't compute. But not only that, I'll fast, that was the big gamble, the big moment, like, oh no, we're gonna have to make a choice. And it ties into something that happened in the intro of the movie where Victor had to make a very hard choice. That I won't spoil because it's the biggest twist of the film. But anyway, it's a choice, like, oh, we have to choose one. I can't choose. No, it's, it's not right. Well, we can't choose between our daughters. But then eventually... The one, the whiny dad of Catherine says, I choose Catherine! So then Angela is about to, you know, supposedly she eventually like levitates and then pukes onto the ceiling, falls, and we think she's dead. But then what ends up happening is Catherine's instead, and now Angela is no longer possessed. Well, why? So the demon just let itself get, like the demon just said, I'm out, bye. He's just like, all right, this was a fun game. See you guys. <laughs> I had a good time playing. Like, why? It doesn't make sense. Why would he do that? And why did he keep letting himself get caught? All the demon does is talk. The demon's entire purpose here is just to be an annoyance, a nuisance, flicking lights on and off, filling up the bathtub with dirty water, saying some profanity here and there. That's it. Like, it's just a prankster. It doesn't even do anything. It's not even like that. It only defended itself when the pastor was about to, like, get rid of it. So then it, the guy, other than that, it just kind of, like, chills out. Well, and I guess when, when it stabbed the lady's eyes. But aside from those two instances, all it is is just a, a bother. And annoyance. And now all of a sudden, it's like, it's had its fun, so it left. Even though they have done nothing to actually get rid of it, or actually make it want to leave. It just did. For no reason. It was so unearned, it was so unsatisfying, so unfulfilling, and so lame. Like, I don't even know how they're supposed to turn this into a trilogy. How? The only thing I could see them trying to do is be like, Oh, Angela actually is still possessed. He's just hiding himself better now. And, and that, of course, is probably the direction it's going to go, which is the laziest direction, but the only one it can go. There's no other options left for it, so they've already spent $400 million on this. They're going to make a sequel, and then a sequel after that one. It's going to be a trilogy. They, like I feel like there's no way they pump the brakes on it, even though this is flopped. They're going to have to because they're already so deep in the hole. I just don't know how they even try to salvage it. I don't, I don't see how. This was terrible. It was actually terrible laughable even people were giggling at this movie it's just it's not good like i can't believe they spent 400 dollars on the most iconic franchise rights and blew it this badly it's just i don't know it's crazy to me but i wanted to talk about this because i think this is probably the biggest waste of money i've ever seen in hollywood so that's pretty impressive that's about it see ya yeah i saw this movie last night i'm sure Almost none of you had any interest in seeing this, but I still have to rant about it anyway. It's not a horror movie per se, but I think it kind of billed itself as one, so I went into it expecting it to be one, and I think most people are under the impression. It's one of the sillier films of the year. I don't think it's worse than Tarot, I don't think it's worse than The Strangers, but man, this was still so bad. And what's really cute is that it actually has the old lady from Tarot. So she now has an incredibly stacked 2024 where she has now been in two unbelievably atrocious stinkers. And that's kind of admirable. And she plays the exact same character in this movie as she did in Tarot for the most part. The premise is cool. So I actually like the premise. The premise is basically Dakota Fanning, she finds herself in the forest after a uh, pet delivery gone wrong and she stumbles upon this weird building with these three strangers in there and every night they have to lock themselves in and they get watched by mysterious entities on the outside that they can't see they can only hear and it lends itself well to some kind of cool mystery but do, do you do, does anyone care about spoilers i can't imagine anyone really gives up like is anyone to shake their fist at me like how how dare you if I get into spoilers? Okay, most people are saying no, they don't care about spoilers. If you care about spoilers, my apologies. You can write a strongly worded letter to the manager. So, the film has a cool premise. And about halfway through the movie, probably not even halfway through the movie, 
they kind of just immediately show their holes and they tell you what this what the watchers are and you get to see the watchers and they're basically just like these generic tall slendermen and it turns out they're fairies like fairies and then the movie dives into like actual tumblr fanfic where it's like before the there was humans and fairies living in peaceful symbiosis we coexisted with the fairies together but we feared their shape-shifting abilities, how they could become us. So we ripped off their wings and we forced them underground and we locked them under a stone. And now, they can't leave this forest because we asked them not to, basically. So, what they're being watched by is fairies that study them so that way they can take their shape better. It's so dumb. This is not M... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's not M. Night Shyamalan... It is his daughter. This is a Shyamalan family production, basically. And in Shyamalan fashion, it's a cool premise that they had nothing good to do with it past the idea, like the ideation. So let me just start breaking down some scenes for you. So, it just happens for the sake of it happening without any explanation for why this is happening. So it starts off okay because the premise is fun. And then as things start to unfold... Dakota Fanning is rebellious, and she's got a dark and mysterious past, and she decides to start breaking the rules that the old woman has set. One of the rules is don't go into the burrows, because that's where the watchers come out. And she goes into the burrows with the help of this guy, I forgot his name. She goes into the burrows and she sees, like, bicycles and, like, children's toys and stuff. And then all hell breaks loose because the fairies start shape-shifting. But they know this, like, there's no explanation given, really, like a good one, for why the fairies can't leave the forest. They could just walk out of the forest. There is an explanation, explanation given for why they can't leave, the humans here, because they're lost, and they can't be out at night because the fairies hunt at night, and they don't like the sun, they're like vampires. So they can't leave the forest, I get that, that makes sense. But the fairies, the only explanation for why they can't leave the forest is because they were forced underground a thousand, or like thousands of years ago. But they could just walk out. Like, there's no magical force field preventing that. They could just walk the out and then dig a hole. Like, they're afraid of the sun, walk out during the night, dig a hole, stay there during the day, get out of the hole, walk out in the night, dig more holes. It turns out there was a professor who built this building, and who built this bunker underneath the building because he's been studying the fairies and this was highly unnecessary to even include in there they just wanted to make him like a guy he's like he recorded himself with this webcam he's like sailor's log 2009 i started construction on the bunker i hired locals from the town nearby for five schmeckles an hour to build it for me and i urged them to stay out at night so they'd get mauled in by the fairies lord forgive me for my sin but it's like, brother, you didn't have to do that. Like, you didn't have to just have them. Like, that's highly inefficient, because then you have to go get more workers every single time and recycle over their dead corpses. Like, you, you would have to walk over so many for that to happen. You could have just, like, had them do the work, and then had them go home before it gets dark out, and then have them come back. Like, you didn't need that. But it's, it's things like that. Eventually, he catches a fairy, and he's, like, training it like a pet. So... They're watching these videos of him training the fairy, like learning from the fairy. And then randomly in his last entry, he's like, I've got it. I've got no choice. I'm going to take it behind the barn and I'm going to shoot it in the heart. And then I'm going to shoot myself. <laughs> For no reason. It's like he's, he spent like a hundred days with this fairy in a cage. And then he's just like, you know what? I'm tired of playing with this toy. I'm going to put it in the kill myself. So he does. Or so you think. So it turns out that fairy was actually a half fairy. Because thousands of years ago, fairies and humans used to... And what happened is, they gave birth to halflings. That live amongst us in secret. And that fairy that he captured was a halfling. One that could walk in the day. Uh, they called her the Daywalker. Her real name that she said was Arintha... Arintha Buna or something? Arintha, Arintha Rancor? Rancor? Balrog? I don't remember. Something like that. But all this is just like getting vomited at you all at once at the end of the movie. It's just like an overwhelming amount of just nonsense. 
anyway, uh, the doctor, the professor, eventually in one of the recordings says, "Hey, I left the boat over there. You can just like go this direction, get on the boat, and leave if you want." So they do. And while they're going there, keep in mind they're fully that all of the fairies can change their shape into human beings. This goober here, this absolute imbecile, as they're running the boat, he hears one of their friends in the forest and like struggling. He's like, John, help. I think his name is John. He's like, John, I need help. Please, please. And he's like, I'm coming, I'm coming. So he grabs the guy and turns out it's not John. So then he, and they take his shape. And then they sail into the town. And then... Big plot twist, the old lady was a fairy the whole time. She was the halfling the professor kept as a pet. Because it turns out the professor had a wife. And the wife and the professor tried to train a halfling, or tried to train a fairy to shapeshift into his wife so he could keep her. And it, that's who this is the whole time. It was a fairy. So like his whole thing was like, their shapeshifting abilities can bring anyone back from the dead. Which they can't. It's not resurrecting the dead. It's literally just cosplaying as the dead. It's LARPing as a dead person. So him having this galaxy brain sch scheme of bringing his wife back never had any water to it. Like, no salt. Because his wife is still dead. You're then just... You, you have a puppet of your wife. That's it. At that point, just get a doll. Right? Like, it's stupid. His plan is stupid from the beginning. And then... She's mad because fairies hate humans because of what they did, which is why the watchers watch them and like them if they break the rules. They study them and they kill them because they're mad. Thousand years worth of bad blood and a grudge. But when old lady is confronted by Dakota Fanning in the, clim the climactic final battle, Dakota Fanning's like, I know what it's like to not feel like you belong. Because it turns out her dark and mysterious past is she got her mom because they were on a road trip. And she was like a little brat who rolled down the window and the mom was like, can you roll up that window? And then Dakota Fanning's like, I hate you! I hate you! I hate you! I'm not rolling down the window! I'm not rolling down the window! So the mom's like, what are you doing? Why are you freaking out? And she's like, I'm gonna roll up the window, window myself. So the mom starts rolling up the window and Dakota Fanning's character puts her fingers out the window and gets them crushed. And she's like, ah! And then the mom's like, what happened? And then she crashes into a car. And so she carries that guilt with her the entire time. And she like trauma dumps that at the end. So then the halfling gets all of that information and Dakota Fanning's like, the professor never told you, you're half human. And she's like, no, no, I can't be. I'm so conflicted. And then she like, she's like suffering from the revelation that she's half human, half fairy. And then her wings pop out of her butt and then she flies away. And, and now she's looking for more halflings. It is, it, it's pretty bad. It's pretty bad. But it's not nearly as bad as some of the other trash this year, but it, I, I like, there was multiple times where I did this, like, I, I gestured this emote. Because it was, they were, they were just making things up out of nowhere with no real payoff or build up to it. They're just like, oh yeah, end this. Oh yeah, end this. Because of that, because, because I said so. Should watch a bad movie in the sub discord with everyone. That's kind of a fire idea. But yeah, I just wanted to share that because I saw this last night. <laughs> I just had to relay the information. No, I really think the Shyamalan family has great ideas. This is a cool premise for a movie. What they need, what, what the Shyamalan family desperately needs, is somebody to flesh out their premise better than they can. That's what they need. Like, this movie could have probably... You all know how much I love horrible, bad movies, and I am just giddy with excitement right now to talk about a movie I just saw that I now consider to be the goofiest film ever made. I just got back from the theater from seeing Moonfall, which is Roland Emmerich's new disaster porn. He's the man behind, like, 2012, Day After Tomorrow. And with this bad boy, he has created the stinker masterpiece, a smelly magnum opus. This movie, I can't even believe, actually exists. I, I, I saw it in IMAX because I don't like to just watch a bad movie. I want to feel a bad movie. And goddamn did I feel it deep in my... This was an absolutely wild ride from start to finish. If somebody asked me what the best movie ever made was, I'd say Moonfall. If someone asked me what the worst movie ever made was, I'd say Moonfall. I don't know whether to give Moonfall a 100% on the moist meter or a zero. This thing was so beautifully 
awful in all of the perfect ways. I, I just can't describe it. It is the actual perfect storm of dog put into film. The movie was like two hours long, and I swear to God, it felt like 20 minutes. I was upset when this movie ended. I just wanted it to keep going and going. This movie could have ran eight hours, and I wouldn't have complained if it kept up this intensity. It was an amazing experience. So, spoiler alert, I want to go into it. I, I really want to peel apart these stinky cheeks and tell you all about this movie start to finish. And let me just go ahead and say, this movie had the audacity to try and hint at a universe, like a Moonfall extended universe, kind of like the Marvel or Star Wars universe they created. Moonfall did that at the end, and I need a sequel. The, the human race deserves a sequel to Moonfall. So let's, let's get into it. So the movie starts with our main character, Brian, played by Patrick Wilson in space with our other extremely important character, I forgot her name already, but played by Holly Berry. That's another thing about this movie. I saw it with Andrew, and the second we left the theater, we couldn't remember a single one of the characters' names apart from, like, Brian and the cat's name, which was Fuzz Aldrin. So, like, that's another thing. Like, all the characters are super forgettable. I'm getting ahead of myself. So, Holly Berry and Patrick Wilson's character, they're in space working on a, the space shuttle. And there's another character there with them that's helping, and then all of a sudden, a cloud of space dust blasts this ship. It tears it to pieces, knocks out Holly Berry, and it sends Brian, like, scrambling to get inside. And then the other guy, who I don't even know if they even gave a name to, his line gets cut and he just gets sent, like, quadruple backflipping through space for all eternity. And then when they arrive back at Earth... They blame Brian for the whole event, despite there being camera footage of this space dust <laughs> being the culprit, destroying the ship. They're blaming Brian. They're like, you are a disgrace. Your negligence caused the death of an astronaut and the destruction of so much money worth of, uh, you know, NASA parts. You're, you're going off book now. Get out of NASA. So then he gets fired. His wife leaves him. His kid hates him. He's now like this who is really just scraping by and struggling. For some reason, the whole trial was public and he's insisting he was innocent. It was this very strange technological space dust that f just flew through like a fart. And he traced it back to a, a corner, like a, like a quarter of the moon called like Mars Capri Sun or something. I already forgot the name of it. But no one believed him. Everyone mocked him. He got fired. His life ruined as a result. Uh, and then we're introduced to a very important character called KC. KC is a conspiracy theorist who really cracks the code that the moon is falling out of orbit. And KC believes it's because the moon is actually a megastructure put there by aliens. So he has his own little group of conspiracy theorists that also believe in the megastructures. Mega and he tries very hard to bring this information to NASA to let them know that the moon is out of orbit, shit's gonna get rough. So just like in Majora's Mask, the moon is coming closer to Earth, and the closer it gets to Earth, the worse it is for humans because the gravitational pull from Earth will rip apart the moon, sending all of these giant chunks into the planet, destroying pretty much everything. A doomsday event, an apocalypse. And no one's believing KC, even though he has all of the research and evidence to back it up. So eventually, he turns to Twitter. And he makes an anonymous post with all of the evidence and miraculously overnight the entire world believes him. It becomes the number one trend and every single news outlet everywhere is talking about it. NASA comes to corroborate it. They're like, now everyone knows, yep, Moon's about to start up. So then they all try and come up with plans. And I swear to God, every character in this movie makes the stupidest decisions at every possible moment. It blew me away. It's like every character, even the ones that are supposed to be smart, like the scientists, are like lobotomized zombies. They get nothing right. None of it makes sense at all. But even suspending disbelief, you can't just, you can't help but just sit there and scratch your head like there's no way they just said or did that. Like I'm trying to sum it up to give you the cliff notes before I like start really dissecting it. So once it's been confirmed that the moon's coming to the earth, uh, Brian, the disgraced astronaut, teams up with Casey. Uh, they, they hang out for a bit and then... Holly Berry, who's still employed by NASA, just out of nowhere sends a helicopter to pick both of them up to, to help them defeat the moon. Because now the moon's like a raid boss. 
So then they come up with a plan to like take an EMP device to the moon. Everyone believes them now. Also, NASA confirmed all of this and then like really figured they needed Brian's help because they sent like a crew of three astronauts up to check out that crater and then the giant space dust came up in the shape of like a like a goddamn ringworm and it all three of them so then they conclude like yep there's something weird and wacky going on with the moon it's got some kind of artificial intelligence living inside of it so then that's when Brian and KC come uh my god I I really want to get deeper into it, but I want to give everyone like the full overview of the movie so you can see it. This whole movie is like taking the insanity of a Neil Breen movie, but giving it a hundred million dollars to realize the craziness. Better example for all the weebs. If you've seen Gurren Lagann, Gurren Lagann, where they start in un like underground and then by the end of the show, they're in space mechs throwing galaxies at each other. It's that, but for pseudoscience and conspiracies. It it's mind-blowing. So... Brian, Casey, Holly Berry, they're at, at NASA. Everyone knows Doomsday's coming, so they're all, for some reason, taking refuge in Colorado. The word Colorado must have been mentioned a million fucking times throughout this movie. I, this had to be just some kind of propaganda to increase tourism there or something. And also you see Kaspersky on billboards, and apparently all of NASA is powered by Kaspersky antivirus because every time they fire on a computer, it just says, Kaspersky. Hey, and that's all there is on the screen. It's just like they look at Kaspersky and things start helping. But I keep getting too specific. Again, everyone's at NASA. They come up with a plan. They get this old EMP device that they're going to take to the moon and the space worm. And this also confirms that that space dust that blew up the ship that Brian was on initially were nanobots from the, from the AI. So they've got the plan. They've got the EMP. They've now got Brian to pilot it. Uh, but something goes wrong. The moon's getting closer, so an earthquake happens, and it cracks the coolant in one of the engines, and it plays out exactly like this. I'm not exaggerating. Holly Berry and Brian go up to check out what's going on. One guy says, the coolant's leaking, and I don't know how to fix it. No one here can really fix it. And she's like, are you sure? And he's like, yeah. And she's like, all right, well, that's the end of the mission. I guess everyone needs to go home. So every single person at NASA, except for Holly Berry, Casey, and Brian as well as two other data analysts and a couple of military guys, all leave and abandon the Earth and just like, yep, I guess we just have to accept this is the apocalypse and there's nothing we can do. Just because one of the coolants was leaking a little bit, and then the solution, I you not, was we'll just fly without it. Apparently the entire time they could just fly without it because the moon was close enough, and Casey knew that and then relayed the information a little late to Holly Berry, and she just didn't bother to call anyone back. She's like, alright, well I already told them they can leave, they can just, they can go, we can do it ourselves. So then we get our, our heroes, Strap it into the spaceship, ready to take on the moon. And as the moon's getting closer, it's causing gravitational disturbances. So there's water that's getting up, and it's like giant waves of water that are just standing there. And those two like data analysts that stayed behind that I briefly mentioned, they, they get evacuated. They get into a helicopter with the military people because the waves are getting closer as the moon's over. And I, I can't even believe this happened. They take off with plenty of time to escape. But instead of going away from the waves, the goddamn pilot kamikazes into the waves and it's supposed to be this emotional moment of, oh my god, there is no escape. But, he, but like you can see, when the helicopter takes off, it could have just gone right, but instead inexplicably just goes left into the waves. And uh, I, I'm missing so many impressive details. Brian's son, who hates him, went to jail. Brian got him out of jail. And for some reason, the military flew Brian's son here just to be in, like, the middle of the storm. So Brian's son's there and then needs to take off in a car away from the facility as the waves are getting closer. But instead of taking off, he goes to a mountain and parks just to check out his dad's spaceship as the waves are getting closer. So the spaceship takes off. It's beating the waves. But his son and then Holly Berry's son is also with him. And then their babysitter are all just in this car, outside of this car watching. And then eventually the kid's like, all right, now it's time to probably go. As the waves are literally like bashing the bumper of the car, it's like, okay, we've had our fun. So then they engage on this high-speed chase against the moon. And then they eventually get hunted by people that are like scavenging for parts. Oh my God, it's so much. Uh, so everything on Earth's going, the gravity's all up. Holly Berry, Brian, and Casey are now heading to the moon. And it turns out the AI that inhabits the moon is attracted to electronics, but only if there's organic life inside of it. So the EMP they brought is useless because the AI won't bite it. 
So they're using it like bait and trying to fish with it. But for some reason, it needs to be inside of it. They don't explain why. The AI was circling it and like playing patty cake with the EMP and they didn't blow it up for no reason. They just concluded that it needs to be inside. So uh, they, they get the EMP back and go deeper in the moon. And it turns out the moon is actually a Dyson sphere built by aliens, confirming Casey's theory that also happens to grow potatoes inside of it <laughs> for some reason. And it's a Dyson Sphere encapsulating a white that it's using for its power source. And the AI is sapping the power from the white. And then the AI gets alerted to the crew that's in the spaceship that's flying around. And then a door opens in the Dyson Sphere as the AI is tracking them. And it shuts, closing out the AI and then saving the crew. And then it turns out that the Dyson Sphere wasn't built by just any aliens, it was built by ancient humans, and they communicate to Brian through celestial beams and flashbacks of his son talking to him, kind of like in Effect 3 where the Reapers take on the body of a child. They did that for Brian in order to talk to him. It was a sentient AI being, like it was an AI construct for the Dyson Sphere. It was built by humans that billions of years ago were spacefaring, hyper-advanced technological superstars and eventually they created an AI that turned on them via like kind of like Skynet and it made all of them go extinct but before their final extinction they built giant moons that they would toss out to corners of the universe to try and remake humanity elsewhere and this just happened to be the last surviving one the only one the AI couldn't find until this movie so that's the explanation there eventually <laughs> Eventually, they upgrade the EMP, the, the AI construct on the moon, like turbocharges the EMP, then gets some defense systems going that just start shooting bullets at the AI, and then they're escaping the moon. KC blasts open the hatch with himself inside because he says, you know, an organic being needs to be with the technology in order for the AI to bite me. And he's like, oh my god, KC's gonna... Brian and Holly Berry are upset, and KC's like, no, it's fine. So the AI starts eating him and he's like, you underestimated us, blows up the EMP. And then, you know, Casey's dead, AI's gone now, so the moon is back. So then the moon leaves Earth, and now it's just this giant Dyson sphere that is now outside of Earth and everyone's happy. Earth's super, everything flooded, everything got absolutely destroyed, but there's still some people left and now the moon's our friend again. And, uh, yeah, th that's not where it ends. So, Casey didn't actually fully... The AI construct on the moon installation actually copied his consciousness into their database, and now Casey has become the moon itself. And the last line is, we have work to do. Which hints at expanding the universe and bringing all of the other AI that is still out there into the fold. And my god, I can't wait to see the sequel. I pray there is one because this was amazing. I am not even doing this justice with my brief explanation. I need to get into the nitty gritty of it to tell you just how off the wall this was. So the, the billion year old humans, they basically just created Halo. They just stole Halo's plot for a little bit. The installations they made back then were Halo rings. They all lived on Halo rings. And the AI they made, for some reason, turned on them like Cortana. Almost in the same fashion. They deemed that humans weren't worth saving and that they were inferior to them. And just started wiping them out inexplicably. Like, this movie is incredible. Like, the visuals were kind of cool. Like, you know, you always like to see those big budget disaster visuals. And when they'd have the moon peeking over the earth, it looked cool. And they had awesome lines such as, Watch out, the moon is rising. And then all of a sudden, like, boats would be flying overhead. Manatees falling onto the ground. Oh my god, it was so good. And there was, like, an advertisement for Alexis. Because when there was these people, the scavengers that were hunting down the, the sun, eventually the sun meets up with the Brian's wife and her, her new husband that cucked him or whatever. And they're on this high-speed chase. And they can't get away, right? These scavengers, they're so fast. And they, they want their oxygen tanks. And they're in a Lexus, and they keep zooming in on the Lexus and, like, throwing it, drifting around. 
And the dad goes, hold on, I'm putting this into speed. And they zoom in on the Lexus logo, and then him turning from economy mode to sport mode. And then it turbocharges and goes wild. And then they're able to outrun him. This movie, man, is actual genius. Like, I can't talk enough about it. Every single moment of this movie, when you think they've run out of stupid juice, finds another way to make it even dumber. And I couldn't appreciate it more. I loved it. I loved it. I don't even know how you make a movie this dumb. On, on accident, too. Like, this isn't a movie. There is no in this movie at all. There's a couple of jokes, but they're not like jokes. They're just like general, decently written jokes. But nothing is... It really takes itself super seriously, and I love that about it. The best kind of bad movie is one where the director really wanted to do something special, but just didn't have the talent or the vision to realize it. And this is one of those cases. It is, tr in every possible department, the best way to make a bad movie. It is the worst and goofiest movie in all of the right ways. I just don't think you could make a movie this stupid on purpose. I, I, this movie was just an amazing experience. This was something truly special. If you like bad movies, this is the movie to go see. This is going to be 2022's best stupid movie, I think. It would be tough to beat this one. So yeah, I just wanted to talk about this because I've had a smile on my face ever since leaving the theater. There's still so much more I could talk about with this movie. I've barely even scratched the surface of lunacy with Moonfall. But I, it just, without you having seen the movie... It's just, it's not going to make as much sense. And sense is a word that is blasphemous to even use in the same sentence as a moonfall. That word never once crossed the mind of anyone who touched the script for this. The whole movie just felt like it was kids going and then, and then, and then trying to one-up each other. Nothing connects logically. Obviously nothing here is mathematically, scientifically accurate, or even common sense accurate. Like, everything is wrong in the perfect ways. Like for example, they're able to find everyone in the world just because. So like when they find Brian and KC, they're in like this random hotel somewhere and somehow they just get found because. Or like the family is trekking through snow at the very end and somehow they just make it to where they need to be without dying along the way and then get found. Like everything, it just happens because it. And I love that about it. It's so shameless in its horribleness. It was amazing. Just an incredible experience that I wanted to talk about a little bit. Uh, that's about it. See ya. I know it's a little early to call this, but I'm going to go ahead and put this in the books that I think we just got the worst movie that 2024 will experience. We basically got the Lord of the Rings Gollum for movies already this year. And I know I said something similar when Night Swim dropped a couple months ago, but I think Megamind 2 Doom Syndicate is much worse, and I'd like to explain why. It just dropped today, and I've already had the entire day ruined by watching it, so I wouldn't wish that curse upon my worst enemy. I know that's not shocking news, there's no one surprised to hear that this is horrible, but I was certainly surprised at just how atrocious it is. Just by giving it the old eyeball test, everyone who looked at any of the trailers or like the six minute sneak peek they gave could immediately recognize that they really brought their A game when making Megamind vs. the Doom Syndicate. And by A game, I mean game. This looks like Turbo. Me, it is, it's an eyesore to watch. And the only known cure for sore eyes, as recommended by optometrists, is God, baby. That's right, the worst movie of the year may have just dropped, but the best comic of the year just came out. God, issue 5 is here right now. You can pick up a copy at badegg.co, link in the description. First of all, it follows a beloved animated film from 2010. The original Megamind was a huge hit, people really liked it, and that was 14 years ago. So it's old enough now to be calling your mother a whore on Xbox Live, and out of nowhere announced that they were going to be releasing the sequel this year. And people were pumping their fists like, yeah, more Megamind, let's go! Until they watched the trailer. Immediately, you can see that the Megamind sequel, 
looks significantly worse than the original. Not only does it look worse than the movie from 2010, it looks worse than the video games from 2010 that were just shovelware. The Mega Mind PlayStation game, which was legitimately just a quick cash grab because that was during the era where every movie had a subsequent game release, just to continue double dipping, double fisting into the consumer's pocketbook, it somehow looks worse than that game, which again was just a quick cash grab. So what was the point? I don't really get it. After watching the movie, it really seems like they did this purely out of obligation, or they did this to test if AI could make a full movie. And I know that's a criticism that gets tossed around a lot, but I really do think AI had a strong hand in the creation of Megamind Doom Syndicate. The, like, there's just no reason for its existence. I'd call it a waste of money, but it doesn't feel like they spent any money on it in the first place. Like everyone could recognize from the trailer, it looks horrible. It's as cheaply made as possible. Jimmy Neutron is more visually appealing than this. It just, I don't get why the f they'd make it to begin with. It's not like they even really had a story to tell either. It's as simple as it gets. Megamind's the hero now. The Doom Syndicate, they, they want him to be again, so he puts on this facade that he's and only pretending to be a hero. And it's just such a snooze fest. Like, nothing happens at all because they didn't want to animate anything at all. So even when you reach the end of the movie, where they're having like the final showdown between Megamind and the Doom Syndicate, it looks like you're watching a scene out of the Butt Ugly Martians. They put no effort into any aspect of this. I thought maybe they were saving the budget for the final fight, but that was actually the worst animation for the entire film, surprisingly. So the final fight, it's basically one move for each member, and it defeats them. So, you know, the hypnotist, he gets defeated because Megamind pours a little bit of concrete on him. The lady who's controlling the weather, shooting lightning, she gets defeated because he has her shoot the lightning and it redirects at her and it defeats her. And her defeat is a clip I'd really love to play because it is the perfect example of how lazy this is. The lightning hits her and she's like, ooh, and then they don't bother animating anything. So what they do is they just drag her down and then she falls over. The word stiff doesn't even do it justice. It really feels like this was left in by accident. Like it was like the pre-viz, you know, before they go in and polish it up. But then they just said, eh, f*** it. Run it. Just, let, just print it as is. It's so bad. There is nothing in here that's even remotely interesting. The writing is just the safest, by-the-numbers, formulaic lines ever. Non-stop puns out the wazoo, which really makes me feel like AI had a large role to play in it, because a lot of the puns feel like something ChatGPT would spit out if you're trying to do like a comedy night with it. It just doesn't work at anything it even aims to do, because it doesn't aim to do anything. It's just actually a waste of an hour and 25 minutes. I think it's actually just there to be noise for children. Like, th there's no other purpose for it, it's just a lot of noise for kids, but it doesn't realize that in this day and age, kids get unlimited amount of noise through things like TikTok, where parents just sit them down in front of an iPad and they just endlessly doom scroll TikTok. This is going to be boring even to them, because the attention span has rotted so far, deteriorated to such a alarming degree. This wouldn't do anything. Like, I don't think kids are going to be you know, Megamind Doom Syndicate fans, because it's boring. I can't think of a single redeeming quality about this movie. Pretty much no one can. It has like a 6% on Rotten Tomatoes. So not even like the most generous critics in the world can drum up a single compliment for it. I would hesitate to call this better than Food Fight, which is that animated disaster that I'm sure everyone remembers because it's been memed to... It is infamous in how bad Food Fight is, and I would say that this isn't really any better. I would actually say that this is more soulless than Food Fight, at the very least. The only thing worse than watching Megamind Doom Syndicate is watching Megamind Rules, the TV show spin-off that they also released the same day as this movie. So, big surprise if you didn't get this news. They released this sequel movie, Super Stinker, and then they also said, and guess what? There's more, and released an eight-episode TV series. And holy, the TV series is even worse. I didn't watch all eight episodes, I couldn't. I made it through three. I don't know if there's a human being strong enough on this planet to power through all eight of those episodes without blowing their brains out. It is torturous. 
It's so insultingly bad. And yes, I get that this is made for kids, but that doesn't mean that it has to be unwatchably. Avatar The Last Airbender. The primary was made for kids, but anyone of all ages can appreciate it. A good show, even if it's aimed at a younger, can be appreciated and enjoyed by people of all ages. That's the sign of good, high-quality entertainment. This is definitely not that. I think they would have been better off just making a Mega Mind world in Fortnite custom games. It would have at least been a little more entertaining, I imagine, if you put little mini games in there or something. But watching the movie or the show here is just not worth it at all to anybody of any age, I imagine. Like I said, I don't see this being a hit with children because it's, at its core, boring. It's a nothing burger. There is nothing that happens in the show or movie at all. At most, what you'll get is Megamind firing his blaster. And that's it. There's really nothing else. The villains barely use their powers at all, really. I mean, they kind of do, but they only use it for, like, a single projectile each, mainly. It's just, uh, it's so lame. I don't think anyone is going to like this at all. And I'm not saying the only way for this to have been successful is to have a ton of action or anything, but Jiminy Christmas, it certainly would have helped keep you awake when watching it. The writing is just so bad. Like, even, like, for a kid's show, it's bad. Spongebob is a kid's show. And that has great writing. Like, it doesn't matter how old you are or anything. It has great writing if you're 3 years old or 30 years old. Megamind, it, I don't think it's going to appeal to any age whatsoever. Like, if you put this on, if you put on Megamind rules while you are pregnant, even your fetus would be bothered by it. It'd start kicking and throwing a tantrum inside your belly. It'd be trying to find ways to strangle itself with the umbilical cord or something. Like, it is miserable. No one, I think, will like this. Megamind vs. Doom Syndicate is a movie. Megamind rules as a show. It was a waste of time. A complete waste of time. So yeah, that's really about it. See ya. Madam Web is a movie a lot of people wrote off pretty quickly. The trailers are abominable. Let's not, you know, beat around the bush here. And the press tour that Dakota Johnson went on, who was the lead for this film, was a real head-scratcher because she just openly seemed to despise the film with the way she talked about it. One of her interviews, she's like, yeah, I don't even know if the movie's good. And, spoiler alert, turns out it wasn't. So, maybe she really can see the future, because she knew this one was a super stinker. This movie is a straight-up clunker. And this film was produced by some of the best in the business, Matt Sizama and Burke Sharpless. Those might not be household names, but I promise you're familiar with their work. Their resume is nothing but heaters. Dracula Untold, Last Witch Hunter, Gods of Egypt, Power Rangers... Morbius and Madam Web. They are, without any exaggeration, undoubtedly the Kobe Bryant and Shaq of producing dog movies. They only write horrible garbage. And somehow they keep getting worse. Now, I wouldn't say this film is worse than Morbius, but I would say it's just as bad. It's not better. It is just exactly the same as Morbius in terms of how dog it is. So it's really impressive that throughout this decade of Matt Sazama and Burke Sharpless working in Hollywood, they have somehow found a way to start awful and find new ways of getting worse at it. And then accidentally making the Power Rangers movie that was at least pretty decent. I didn't hate that one. But everything else, everyone hates for the most part. But anyway, with that out of the way, let's talk about Madam Web here. So, I'm not clairvoyant, but I think everyone's going to dislike this one because there's almost nothing to like about it. The actors and actresses in here, they really don't seem to try very hard at all, save for a couple of scenes, which I think probably were some of the first scenes that were when the script was different. As I understand it, this script went through a lot of changes from when Dakota signed on to what eventually got puked out onto the big screen here. So, I think some of the good scenes where like the performances are actually giving an, uh, about what's going on, were probably from the original shoots before everything got cattywampus and ruined somewhere along this messy journey. But for the most part, you're not even really watching superheroes versus supervillains. You're watching zombies kind of just speak at each other occasionally. It's like you're watching performances from people that are sleepwalking through their lines. There's really no true effort. And it's clear from the very beginning of this film 
I wrote notes in the beginning because I couldn't believe what I was watching, and then at some point I got hypnotized and stopped writing notes, and then at the very end, after everything had happened, the dust started to settle as it was like wrapping itself up in the last two minutes, I just instantly fell asleep. Like, I, I, I didn't even feel myself getting tired, my eyes just closed and I was out for like three minutes until Aaron, who went with me, was like, Charlie, you're sleeping, I was like, oh my god. I, I didn't even know, like my body shut down from like how confused I was that this movie even got made in the state that it's in. But anyway, very opening. This is in the trailer, that meme. He was with my mother when she was studying spiders right before she... Or whatever. That line's not in there just like that, but it is in there in the same essence, just broken up. So, from the very beginning, that bad guy, Ezekiel's line, is... I agreed to be your bodyguard because I thought you were close to finding the spider that can give us the superpowers if we can use its abilities... And I think I was paraphrasing because that was a few lines. She interrupted him at some point. But his first line is, I agreed to be your body I agreed to be your bodyguard because you told me you were close to finding the spider that's gonna give us superpowers or something to that effect. And she's like, it's a very elusive spider because it's so powerful and gives all of these superpowers. Like it th there's no dialogue in this movie that would ever be something a single human being would say to another in the real world. It is baffling that anyone signed off on it. Because these aren't characters, they're just plot point vessels and nothing else. No character here has any personality whatsoever, especially not the three spider women that Madam Web is protecting. They don't get any fleshing out whatsoever, they're basically just three characters that need to be saved just because, and that's it. There's no real reason for it. And Madam Web is a, is a very interesting case study here because she's a paramedic, Thus, her whole career is saving people, yet when it comes to saving these three spider women, she tries her best to just dump them off onto their parents, which is basically just a sentence because they're being hunted by a spider guy. So, like, I don't know what she thought would happen there. Like, the parents just hit spider guy with a frying pan to defeat him or something. But she does not want any part of this responsibility at all, even though her career is saving people. She wants nothing to do with actually saving them and reluctantly does so. But I'm, I'm jumping all around now, too. I'm so scatterbrained with how bafflingly bad this movie was. So anyway, like, even from the very beginning, it was clear that this dialogue was going to be terrible. But it somehow finds a way to get even worse than you'd ever expect it to be. But anyway, so, after the mother finds the spider, she takes it to the camp and Ezekiel betrays her. He shoots two of the people. The mom goes, oh, jeepers, creepers, zoinks. What are you doing? And she says, I don't understand why. And then goes on to explain that this spider, if we can use its uh, properties, can help people. And that's when Ezekiel, the main bad guy, gets his only amount of, even an iota of an attempt to give him a background story or any motivation or whatever at all. He says, not interested in helping people because no one helped me and my family when we were starving. And then he shoots her. That's all we ever get about him as a character. After that, he becomes bent on just the three spider women because he can't stop having nightmares about them and him as, as like a prophecy that's going to happen in the future. We get nothing else about that guy at all. He is actually just cartoonishly beyond that. Nothing else. And he also ends up being a supervillain because he has like these superhuman abilities, but all he does is walk menacingly and crawl on the walls sometimes, and that's it. He at no point ever really seemed like a threat. At all. I even for a second. There wasn't a single scene where I was like, oh, he's here. This is gonna be, this is gonna be a tough one. Also, he can, like, poison people by, like, holding onto them, like, gripping them tight. But other than his cheese touch and, like, the ability to crawl on walls, he doesn't really do much else as a supervillain. Except wine. But anyway, I actually pretty much summed up the entire narrative here. The only thing I left out is how he was born. So after the mother gets, it turns out she was pregnant and the locals that were using the spider's venom for superpowers picked up the mother and then delivered the baby for her after letting a spider bite her which of course gave powers which didn't awaken until that accident that is now in the iconic viral clip that's gone around where as a paramedic she tries to save somebody and then the car ends up hitting the water and she bumps her head and now she can see the future kind of <clears throat> so the that's the origin of her power and the narrative is she can see the future, and at one point she sees these three girls get by a spider guy, and he he's a bad guy, she doesn't like bad guys, so she tries to save the girls from him, and then she's just on the run the entire time. And the spider guy wants to kill them, 
because he doesn't want them to kill him. It doesn't get any deeper than that, really. It's it's very it's very surface level, uh, and that's kind of the entire narrative in a nutshell, with tons and tons and tons of awful scenes that make no sense at all. But I'm not even gonna bother breaking those down for you because who gives a? It's they didn't give up when making it, so why should you, the the member? Uh, I will say though, this film, for being a superhero film, has no action at all. In fact, none of the superheroes even fight the bad guy. And they don't even wear a costume or anything at all until the very, like, last scene of the movie. The only thing you get for, like, a superhero showdown is in Spider-Guy's visions where he sees the three Spider-Women, like, beat him up and then toss him out of a window. And that's, like, a 30-second scene. After that, they never actually fight him at all. What happens is when he shows up, he hits him with a taxi cab at one point, and then that stuns him, and then he shows up again like 30 minutes later, and then he hits him with an ambulance, which stuns him. That's the extent of their fighting. The climactic final showdown, he basically beats himself. So he's using her visions of the future, and like kind of positioning him where he needs to be for the environment to take care of him, because... You know, the environment's going up in flames. They did set up, like, some traps to a certain extent. And they kind of, like, give him obstacles to go through. But it's not really fighting him. It's kind of like amnesia when you're running away from the monster, basically. That's how their fights go with the, the villain. Until eventually the environment beats him. And then he gets crushed by a giant sign. It's... It... This isn't a superhero movie or anything at all. This is just... This is a fest. Is what it is. It's not entertaining. Morbius, I would actually argue, was more entertaining than Madam Web, and that is saying something. But again, I don't think Madam Web is necessarily worse than Morbius. I still think they're about equal in terms of their shittiness. Another thing that's painfully obvious is that this movie did its absolute best to erase any and all mention of Spider-Man or anything in that universe whatsoever and tried to keep all of that as minimal as possible and you could actually feel some cuts where things were just scrubbed so i truly believe the original vision for this film was something entirely different and what we got is just a mess and i'd like to give you a scene that i think perfectly encapsulates just how much effort went into this movie like how much thought went into this movie at the, at the end of the day so while the three girls are hiding from spider guy and I should explain, Spider-Guy, an NSA woman, and got her code to all of the cameras across the globe so that way he could track down the three girls from his nightmares. So he uses that technology to basically transfer his mind's eye image of these three women and get them in the real world. And he used the NSA computers to access all the cameras to real-time find them. with his. So that's how he's able to keep finding them. And, and the gang knew that, they knew they needed to avoid cameras, and they eventually decided to go with Ben, who's friend, and keep the three girls there while he's doing some research of her own. And that's working really well. The three girls are at Ben's place, Spider-Guy can't find them, and that's all, you know, great stuff. And then, the woman staying with Ben has her water break, and she's about to, about to give birth. So now they're rushing to get her to the hospital. And by they, I mean the entire kit and caboodle. The entire group, for some reason, decides to accompany Ben and the woman to the hospital. So all three girls now get in a car and take off down public roads and immediately get picked up by cameras because obviously they would. Why were they going with them to the hospital? I have no idea. They could have just stayed at the house because that was clearly working. And I... I don't know if I didn't hear the reason why they went with them, or if they just didn't even bother because they didn't think anyone would be awake long enough to even get to that scene. I don't know. But they could have just stayed at the house and been completely safe and avoided conflict with Spider-Guy if they had just stayed there. Which would have been the logical thing, too, because why does Ben want these three teenage girls accompanying them to the hospital in the first place for the birth here? There's just no, there's no logic to it. Why would you do, just stay there? Just stay there and wait. But anyway, they don't. That's just an example of how little thought even really went into the movie. I just don't see what the point of making it even was anymore. 
It doesn't tie into anything Spider-Verse related. It doesn't want to. It really doesn't want to. And it doesn't really want to try to stand on its own two legs either. So why make it? I don't get it. It's just another <laughs> blemish on the, the record of this screenwriting duo that keeps making trash. I... <laughs> I, I like after seeing it I'm just kind of at a loss for words for what they expected the response to this one to be because I really can't imagine anyone sitting down and enjoying it the biggest sin this movie commits is that it's boring it's really boring if you're going to a superhero film there's at least a couple of things you expect like the basics of having fights at the bare minimum Morbius for all of its flaws had fights this doesn't even have that there's there's none of that it's just the worst dialogue ever constantly and nothing more and somehow even with all of this dialogue you still learn nothing about the characters they're still so bland because they don't even give them depth or try to it's just constantly either saying not good jokes or just saying a whole bunch of nothing to begin with so anyway to sum it all up madam webb not good boo pretty stinky if I was to plug it into the moist meter, I'd give Madam Web a 15%, I would say. But uh, yeah, I wouldn't even call it like a fun bad movie. It was just, it was just bad. I don't know if this one's going to pop off with memes like Morbius did, because there's really nothing memeable about it other than really bad dialogue and nothing else. It's, yeah. But we'll see. Uh, anyway, uh, that's about it. So yeah. I actually got you with a prank. I wanted to mention one more thing. By the end of the film, finally, you know, figures out how her powers work really well, and she immediately uses it to be annoying. So, at the end of the film, she ends up going blind to match her comic book counterpart, and she immediately starts seeing the future for everything. And the way she applies this is the the three girls come over with some takeout food and she's like oh thanks for the and then list the takeout food and they're like how did you know that and she just smiles i saw it and then she says bless you to one of them and she goes what do you mean bless you achoo predicting her sneeze so she's using it just to be annoying that's so hype <laughs> i mean amazing i just had to mention that okay now now that's it see ya I wasn't even going to bother covering Halo Season 2 because it doesn't seem like most people care about it anymore after how abominable Season 1 was. It was an affront to God that insulted the very technology that gave us the ability to watch moving pictures in the first place. Halo Season 1 was atrocious. So there were very low expectations going into Season 2, but as I said on stream multiple times, the first two episodes I actually thought were going in a pretty good direction, like I was impressed. It seemed like they did bring on new people that were familiar with the property, and as I understand it, they did. And you could kind of feel a little bit more being put behind this project, however, there were still the remnants from Season 1 that they couldn't just write out, so instead they had to kind of change trajectory with all of these, like, pieces that were grandfathered into Halo Season 2. And I liked what they were doing with characters that were previously super underwhelming. They were putting in them putting them in more interesting positions in the overarching story as opposed to these like snooze fest side plots that no one gave a f about. But then the show fell back into its old ways, it stumbles, and it just starts going in the worst directions again. Until the season finale, which I actually thought was handled pretty well. There was a lot of really cool in the season finale, but then, even still, there was some really stupid too. Because it seems like, in this series, the way the plot advances is by characters making really dumb, out-of-character decisions. Like, really, like, everyone happens to be getting pumped full of stupid juice, and they'll just all of a sudden do something dumb which then advances the plot in a big way. Like, that is something that's happened a couple of times now. But I do think Halo Season 2 is an improvement over Season 1, which of course isn't like the biggest compliment you can give, because that's a pretty low bar, but I am happy with some of the things about it, but overall, again, disappointed, because it's still not good. By no means is Halo Season 2 great or anything. 
And I wasn't going to talk about this because everyone expected it to be bad anyway. I'm not exactly enlightening anyone here by letting you know that, yep, Halo Season 2 is also bad. But then I saw this Kotaku headline. Halo Season 2 sticks the landing, I told you so. Halo series naysayers show yourselves because the Paramount Plus show is hitting all the right notes. If those notes are fart sounds, I guess, the sound of like a wet B flat in your trousers. They go on to say that it does everything a video game adaptation should do and then some, and then goes on to say that they've been saying for over a year that the show is good. That is mind-boggling to me. Like, I understand there's differences of opinions, but this opinion is so bad it should be borderline criminal. Like, this is something that should have you undergo, like, a psychiatric evaluation. What do you mean this is what every video game adaptation should do and then some? How? It doesn't use anything from what it's adapting. It doesn't take anything from the actual source material. It's telling its own fanfic and it's doing an extremely poor job of it. Halo Season 1, they've been saying they've been talking about this show being good for over a year, meaning they must have enjoyed Season 1. Halo Season 1 is bad even if you don't know what Halo is. On its own two feet, it stumbles and eats... Halo Season 1 is just bad television no matter how you spin it. It is a show that had a huge emphasis on the worst parts of television. For some reason, there was this fixation on showing Master Chief's cheeks, which is what gave it the title of Master Cheeks because there were so many of him for no reason. I've already made a video covering everything I think that's wrong with Halo Season 1, so I'm not just going to regurgitate all of those points here. But the point I'm making is that this is not what video game adaptation, uh, adaptations should be by any means at all. The Halo television series is unrecognizable from the Halo franchise that it's taking from. The only thing they share in common is names and armor. That's it. You're not going to find Master Chief, a human that happens to be part of the Covenant, literally steaming her ham in the middle of this by playing Halo 1 through 3, reading the books, or even, God forbid, playing the 343 Halo games. That is exclusive to just this misguided television show. Now, as I've always said, there's no point in adapting things one-to-one, -one, because what's the point there? You need to take it in different creative directions, but this is so outlandish in the Halo universe that it doesn't have a connection. There's no point in calling it Halo. At least, this is still me talking about Season 1. I ended up focusing on that too hard because of how ridiculous that statement was in this article from Kotaku. And I know Kotaku is on life support right now, just pumping out as much rage bait as they can to try and get as many pity clicks and desperation as they can possibly muster. I get it. They're in their spiral. But this still, like even knowing it's rage bait, was enough to make me just want to come in here and talk about Season 2 since it wrapped up. Now going back to this, there is one thing that I do agree with them on, it's this last sentence. Action sequences felt tighter and better choreographed, emotional beats hit when they were supposed to, and the interwoven story threads made for incredibly watchable television. What I agree with from that statement is that last part, watchable television. That's not the high compliment that the writer thinks it is. Calling something watchable is like the bare minimum. That's like the lowest possible thing you can say. That's like if you're getting bullied and the teacher makes them say something nice to you. Like that is like the tiniest compliment you can give it. And that's what I can say about season two is that it is watchable. And I'd even agree that the action sequences are pretty tight and well choreographed. I do think that the action when it's present in season two is pretty good and interesting. Granted, you still have to suspend disbelief and just accept that everyone on screen's a moron at all times, because even right away, even in the two episodes I was praising, there's a scene where the Marines are in a dark tunnel and there's a covenant on the other side, and they know there's some danger out there, but instead of turning on their light, they just keep going in like groups of two or two or three into the darkness to like they're being led by Noah to get on the ark two by two. They just go out there and just get slaughtered by the covenant in the dark without ever turning on their flashlight, which they have. They have the technology to turn on a flashlight and they just don't because you, that's why it's silly. But again, the action sequences, I do agree, are tight and well choreographed for the most part. Anyway, I'll go ahead and start by saying a few things I think Halo Season 2 does well. And the biggest thing, the big standout here, is Ackerson. Ackerson is a villain that was present in Halo lore before Season 2, and he is played by an actor named Joseph Morgan, who is actually a fan of Halo. And you can feel it through his performance. He does a great job at being the villain. And I think he was a really helpful component of this season to bring in what he knew from Halo to his role. And that really helped elevate it. Ackerson was by far the best part of Season 2, 
hands down. Another thing I think they did really well is actually Master Chief this season. And not so much the way Master Chief is written, but Pablo Schreiber, Schreiber, I'm not sure how you say his last name, as Master Chief. There are a couple of really great moments with Pablo as Master Chief where I was like, damn, if he just had some better material, a better story to work with, he'd be a great Master Chief. Like, I really bought into him as Master Chief in this season. I was like, damn, this could be the guy. Like, if we had a good Halo show, if we were in, like, the multiverse where there was a good Halo show and Pablo was spearheading it, that would be a banger. He, like, I think he really does get it as Master Chief on what that role would require. I do think that in a Halo television show, you can't have him in the armor 100% of the time. In the first season, I was like, man, he should always be in the armor at least 99% of the time. But in season two, seeing Pablo as Master Chief out of the armor, I still got that from him. Every scene he was in, even without his armor, which is pretty much the entire show, he's only in his armor twice, pretty much. No, three times, actually, I think. And the rest of the time, he spent just human being. He's just spent as John. And I still felt like, damn, that's the Master Chief. So he did a great job, really, of embodying that character, even outside of the armor. It's just such a shame that it feels like it comes in a losing effort here, because everything else around these two characters is just not good. I mentioned that Season 2 took some of the characters that had these really boring side quests that felt really insignificant to the plot, like Sorin, like Quan. And it took these characters and put them into, like, the actual main juice here in Season 2. And I really appreciated that effort, but it didn't seem like they were able to commit to just actually having them as a front and center component of the story. Instead, they're still, like, off on their own little adventures half the time that you just don't care about when you look at the actual meat of this. The Covenant are about to get to the Halo ring. The humans are losing. Reach has fallen. Like, all of these really big things. And then you still have to go watch... Quan see ghosts. You have to watch Soren and his wife try and locate their son. Like, that is so underwhelming when put against the big stuff. I'd rather those characters be brought in and contribute to the big stuff as opposed to just kind of being there and then still doing their side quests. Oh, I also did forget to mention one other thing I think they actually do really well. It is a huge spoiler, though, so this is your spoiler. The Flood. I thought they crushed it with the Flood. I was shocked by how well they did the flood here, so I won't get into any more detail than that. I won't like super deep into spoilers, but I actually thought they handled it really, really well. Impressed with that. But honestly, it actually makes me more upset that there were some good moments here and some like actually very impressive because it showed what could be if the rest of the show could just follow suit. There are some elements here that work pretty well, more so in season two than season one had. Like I said, it is an improvement. And it showed that there is the real capacity to create a great Halo show. But it's just not this. I don't know if there's just too many cooks in the kitchen working on this show or what, but there are some wonderful here, and then there is some stinky here. There's some good writing here, like with Ackerson and even some of Master Chief's lines, and then there's some terrible writing here, like with some of Kai's lines, and I'm not going to get too deep into spoiler territory, but some other... Uh, horrible writing choices. There's nonsensical plot holes that are present and never addressed. There's, like, there, it's just such a mixed bag. It seems like there are people on board this team that get it and can deliver great Halo content on the television screen. But there's just too many other moving parts behind the scenes that overwhelm that and lead to what you ultimately get here which is an unsatisfactory season of Halo yet again. Even with all this said, I do think with the finale of Season 2, if there is a Season 3 of Halo, it's actually in a good spot to pick up and be entertaining and actually be pretty solid. I think if there is a Season 3, if they can just dial in on what worked for Season 2 and take it from where the finale ends on their, on their high notes, we might actually see... The first good season of Halo. I don't know if there's going to be a season 3 or not. I don't think it's fully confirmed. It's mainly still speculation right now. But, yeah, I guess... Maybe I'm just being overly optimistic. But it's just there were some good moments here. And I just hate that it's still over overall not good. Like, it's still bad. I don't think it's worth watching. Like, I don't think by any stretch of imagination Halo Season 2 redeems this show and it makes it worth the slog of getting through it. It's not. But Season 3 of this show 
could be decent with where it's at at the moment. Anyway, though, maybe I'll get into like more spoiler heavy stuff about all of the things I dislike about season two on stream or something, but I won't do it here because I know people don't like to hear spoilers and all of that during these things. So I'll just leave it there and I won't continue ranting about it anymore. That's really about it. See ya.